invented a low-cost test for the early detection and remediation of cancer, heart disease. So first two immediate thoughts come to mind. Uh, first of all, how does a high school student uh, get involved in potentially a groundbreaking scientific research? And the second question being, wow, Arnav, you're such a liar. If this test can do so much, how come I've never heard of it? Well, I'm just going to say two things. Utter disbelief is probably what you're thinking, and I don't have a US patent on it yet. So that's probably why. But um, it's also this thing that we see in science over and over again in, in research is essentially we've, we indo we've indoctrinated basically young people's mindsets to see that research is a very exclusive process and is kind of limited to the balding old men hunched around the cell by the assay kits. And we haven't really diversified or we haven't really gone beyond that perspective yet. Um, so. What, what, what really matters? I mean, what I've, what I've seen, the first thing that matters is resourcefulness. Um, it means going to the GNC and getting, getting enzymes, which, by the way, is a great source for dumping soda and getting clean energy for. Yeah. And also, it, it also means going to local welding shops. It also means uh, going to the local brewery. No, not for the beer, but for the argon gas cylinder, of course, to make, you know, argon plasma and of course, right? But, um, no, no, but, it, but, but essentially, essentially it's, it's resourcefulness, creativity, and essentially you're probably going to think about my journey being, you know, you know, the stereotypical emailing hundreds of professors, just that model tenacity, getting that lab space, space, right? Well, you're partially right, except for the part about me actually getting a spot in the lab. So I'm 16 now, so I've never gotten a, you know, a mentor or a formal spot in a lab, but I've really been able to kind of navigate myself through kind of just resourcefulness going to odd places and kind of creativity in general and I think this blindness that you know that research is an exclusive process it's not a creative process is kind of what's limiting you know fast progress and I, I hope through this talk I'll show you that um, that it is possible that these two factors do guide research and these two factors um, will hopefully help make the world a better place and um, so sorry So what, what I essentially was doing uh, throughout, my, throughout my, like, my research here is, um, there, look, look at the red over there. These are called oxidants, or free radicals. And essentially what these oxidants do is that they act as a precursor, or a propagator, for these different types of chronic and degenerative diseases. And as uh, on the previous slide, I showed that there's indeed a correlation, inflammatory diseases. These, all these diseases have this common trait of being inflammatory. And there would be some sort of correlation. I try to essentially, for a few bucks, create um, a really with a you know, cheap voltage sensor. Also, and what I've kind of come to realize is that a lot of the solutions we have come from nature. Um, so I started looking at clouds. You know, I just sit down and you know, look at clouds for a few minutes. Uh, so if you take if you take one part of a cloud, let's say before it starts forming, you have basically this preliminary part that actually is being held in one place. And in science, we call that a steric chain, which is essentially one part of the pol like let's say a long chain of stuff is being held in one place. And if you hold that you know, one chain of stuff in one place, other neighboring stuff, like other parts of the cloud, actually stack on top and form this three-dimensional kind of cloud structure. So I essentially took that for uh, inspiration for you know, making what, I, what, I, what you'll soon to see are called nanoparticles, which allow me to amplify those trace levels of free radicals that I was mentioning earlier. And so, um, so I, I, I did mention that I had, I had some pretty cool opportunities to um, go, go around. And, but really, the, the key thing that you take away from science is that a lot of these things are based on luck. Um, a lot of them are really subjective. So what we really should take away, really, is how, 
how creative can you be? How, how much of an inclusive process can you embody in research? And uh, how can you essentially change the world in the most simple ways? Um, so if you were to give me a general knowledge test right now on physics, chemistry, biology, I'd probably fail it. I'd probably fail it. And the reason I say that is because the type of mindset in research is not a very you know, book-heavy or knowledge-based one. But it's based on looking at things in different ways. So you can see by the Chinese finger trap, you know, there's multiple ways to look at a certain problem. Um, so it's about looking at things in different and kind of uh, ways outside the box, to be cliche. But it's, it's really about that. It's about taking things that are seemingly unrelated and try to essentially reconcile them and come up with new insights. And so what I was kind of looking at is, so how First, I had to kind of correlate these diseases, right? These diseases all seem pretty uh, disparate. They don't seem like they have any correlation at all. Uh, so I started looking in the literature, and I started playing with this software that I downloaded. And it takes five, it's an open source software, five to six minutes. You can download from Google. It's called Avogadro. And uh, you, just, you just drag these gray and blue and red circles of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. I'm really sick of those three elements. You just keep dragging them. And you keep pressing the same button, which is the energy button. Because I, got, I don't have money. So in order to upgrade Avogadro to get more buttons, you've got to uh, pay money. But I only have this button called energy. But it turns out that button's pretty useful. It calculates something called enthalpy, which uh, allows you to see how probable a reaction is to happen. So essentially, you do a combination of the, you know, you know, literature, and a combination of this, you know, just dragging these circles, I was able to show that there is this common biomarker for these different types of diseases, and it's called AOHDG. And so uh, I tried to, through a really convoluted clinical study pattern, I was able to establish that there is a, a really very, very strong correlation between this chemical element, OHGD, and free radicals. So basically, if I, were to, if I were to detect these free radicals uh, you know, at very, very early stages, before even any unique disease can develop, I can detect it and actually remediate it. So you will, 10 years down the line, that cancer you could have gotten will never have developed. So that's kind of the big implication of being able to detect through a method like free radicals, or which is correlated to the biomarker of 8 OHGD. Uh, so, how, how in the world I, was I supposed to detect this biomarker? I mean, I was throwing a lot of vocabulary out there, like sterichain, this and that, but I mean, I, I have to start, I, I didn't know where to start, right? Uh, so, where do I even start from? Uh, well, I, I had to formulate you know, some requirements. Uh, the 8 luckily, uh, it was simple because you could just get that from the urine or a saliva sample. So, you could just literally spit into a container. And if I were to somehow mix this magic chemical, I could somehow you know, amplify this, you know, those free radicals that I was talking about and detect the disease. Um, I wanted to have near perfect accuracy. I wanted it to be really, really low cost, under 50 cents per test. Uh, kind of ensure that third world accessibility, where uh, these kinds of tests are, have no you know, basis at all, really. Near instant results and the early detection before the unique disease even develops. Uh, so what was I going to able to do? Well, so kind of how I got started thinking about this is um, this does no, by, like, by no means does it show phones have greater value than toilets. But <laughs> in the entire world, the, there are more phones than toilets, which is kind of sad. But yeah, that's, that's the reality of it. And how phones, uh, phones have been, uh, have this really, like this, these like sensor inputs, like audio jacks. And um, there's this product called the Breathometer, which essentially you can simply insert and uh, detect your blood alcohol level. So there's a lot of technology with like electrochemical sensors integrated onto phones, and that kind of really played into my model of going under 50 cents, going really, really cheap in order to detect my list of free radicals. So how was I going to get this to be really, really cheap? I would have to embody some sort of electrochemical or colorimetric model uh, because those are really those are really easy to integrate, which is what I saw with phones. So that kind of gave me the inspiration. So how was I going to get this output or this a very cost-effective way to detect these diseases? Uh, and the answer kind of hit me uh, with nanoparticles. And why nanoparticles? Because essentially, they're, they're so small that their properties change, actually. 
than what you would normally see at what we call a macro molecular scale or in the physical kind of like what you can see. They're so small they actually do things that a lot like bigger objects would be able to do. So essentially when you get this small, your properties kind of like reverse. So you're able to do stuff that's a lot bigger than, than you can you know, normally able to do. So that kind of gave me the inspiration. So if I were somehow able to use these nanoparticles and maybe even amplify the already powerful effect of it and synthesize them in a really, really easy way, then I could proceed uh, with this detection. So, so what, they, what I saw in literature was that they use these really expensive gold-based and silver-based nanoparticles. And the really cost-effective way that's currently out there is they take flavonoids, which are basically like pomegranate, clove, stuff you can get in your kitchen, turmeric. And uh, basically, if you were to mix up this tur uh, these flavonoids with gold salts and silver salts, you could get really easy, cost-effective nanoparticles. But the huge problem was that these aren't sensitive. So uh, that no way would play into my, my model being able to detect these diseases at really, really early stages, like 10 years, 15 years down the line. So how was I able to like, you know, address that problem? And it was with these, these long chain molecules called polymers, which uh, essentially, you know, you can see them in transparency paper. We call that polyethylene interpolate. And you see them in cellulose, or which essentially building blocks of life. You see these everywhere. Uh, but they're really cheap, is the bottom line. So it's not just a big worm, it's a really cheap uh, alternative to metals. So I kind of used those as ways to create the nanoparticles that I was looking at. And once again, I'm back to dragging the circles, the, the circles again, pressing the energy button about 100 more times. And Oh, eventually, what I come up with is that, um, that if I take a salt called polyhistidine, which is the poly one of the polymers that I was looking at, and if I were to just take you know, clove from your kitchen, essentially for 13, 14 cents per test, I can detect those, those different types of diseases. And why? It's because, uh, back to the cloud, I was talking about the steric chain and how, um, this is a lot of stuff, but what I really want you to look at is, uh, there's a chain of the cloud, remember that I was talking about? And if that one part is held in place, other parts of the cloud stack on top and form a three-dimensional network. And three-dimensional networks are good for amplifying these trace levels of stuff because they have really high surface area. So really, really high surface area would uh, enable me to detect really you know, trace levels of free radicals that I was looking at. And I was, I was able to get this one part of the chain to stop moving in this polymer. So in the polymer, essentially, you have like a lot of carbons in there, a string of carbons. And if you get one part fat really, really fast, you can get that one part to stop moving and you can get that three-dimensional effect that I was talking about when the chains, the other chains of the polymer stack on top and then form this three-dimensional network. And essentially, remember those red circles, or I don't know if you do, but in the, in the scale I was showing you, those free radicals, essentially, the thing I was making, the nanoparticle, could eat those up and create water on the other end. So that was pretty cool. Um, so back to the clouds. It all came from this, essentially, the inspiration for how you could create this chemical, this nanoparticle. Uh, and I did like extensive, I mean, it's really, it's really frustrating just to look at solutions because when you make these nanoparticles, really what you're making is you're just taking water, you're putting clove, you're putting a little bit of salt. You don't really know what's going on. You don't see the little nanostructures. It's just this homogeneous solution. So it's kind of frustrating if you, if you don't really know what's going on. But this is the kind of stuff I was doing at first to try to see what type of, you know, what, it would clove be better, would turmeric be better, would pomegranate be better with the salt that I was looking at for the really high surface area effect that I wanted to get to detect uh, those free radicals. And I compared them with the with essentially gold ones that I was talking about earlier, those really, those really expensive ones. And I tried to see, had to establish the, my superiority of the polymers. And so I mentioned it was really frustrating to just look at you know, water all day. So I finally just went to, I finally emailed about 100 people, had a weird thing with the parking official of the University of Oregon, and because I never really, I had no professor connection, so finally through the parking official, I was able to actually get you know, any attention from a professor at all. 
and they eventually, <laughs> and they eventually gave me um, this lab space to actually look at these this water because it was just it looked at it was these just the solutions. I was like, there's is there anything really going on in here? And so I used SEM, which is a scanning electron microscopy. You can look at really really uh, what's going on kind of at nano micro scales and TEM to try to see what was going on. And I wanted to see how good is this at remediating and detecting that free radical. How good is it at you know essentially curing early stages of those diseases? So this this is that this is a fancy instrument called the EPR. I really didn't want to do an animal study, so this was the best way around it. This was the best way to kind of do to see that effect on how how good it is at detecting. And you can see the three dimensional effect is really clear. The high surface area three dimensional effect is really clear in the polymers but not as much in the gold. But really these rough edges really what enable uh, detection of really trace levels of that free radical biomarker I was talking about. So yeah, it's much more efficient. Uh, it's a big, big smiley face because it's higher quenchability, which means it's really good at making that radical into water. Uh, and it's much more higher surface area than what we see with gold and which is low free radical detectability. So you won't be able to detect as well with gold. Uh, and we finally see in the results with that big fancy machine that I said could detect how good this thing is quenching the free radical. You can see that this, I'm gonna just try to break it down. So this green thing is the free radical. So you can see it form. Before you even put in the free radical, there's a red thing. This is the basically what's a, called an empty tube signature. It's that that means there's nothing in there at all. But what you see after I treat it with my nanoparticle is that it almost completely overlaps with the red. That means it's almost like the free radical wasn't even there to begin with. It's almost 100% gone, which is huge. Because now you, you essentially accomplish the theoretical maximum efficiency for detecting the precursors and propagators of major types of chronic and degenerative diseases. So that's, that's huge. Uh, so but really, what do I want you to take away? Uh, science research is a creative process. So I mean, I mentioned earlier that I'm not book smart or really anything like that at all. But I was able to you know, observe this phenomenon in nature and kind of see how I could reconcile that in order to create this. And it doesn't really care about anything except your ideas. That's what science is all about. Uh, yeah, no matter, I mean, I was, I'm 16 now, and I don't, I'm not a professor with multiple degrees, but I was still able to create this. And it, it, it really wasn't much of a, like, a, I'm not a genius or a prodigy or anything. It was really just about being a little resourceful and trying to see what I could uh, dig out in the literature and really just about, you know, dragging the circles again. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't, but there was really nothing special about the entire process other than persistence, dedication. So and intelligence isn't, isn't really, it's a very, really subjective thing. And we try to measure it all the time, but we, I don't think we can. I think it's, it's really, it's, it's not, it's just a, it's not a right, it's not, the, not a right term. It should, it should be creativity, it should be resourcefulness. It should be stuff like this that really helps you know, our world progress. And uh, I really want everybody to take away that they can actually do exactly that. Nothing I did was actually all that special, really, honestly speaking. Uh, if you were to go search a little bit, if you were to go research a little bit, if you were to just look at something totally unrelated and try to reconcile, hey, maybe that is somehow related to something that could potentially do something else that I'm really passionate about. In any, any field you're passionate about, you can go out and change something if you just keep an open mind and try to reconcile potentially unrelated things and just, just think outside the box and that's, that's really what I want you to take away is that any, anything is possible, really. Anything is possible if you put your mind to it. It's cliche, but it is very true. So thank you. Yeah.